Um, I'm the Chief Operating and Risk Officer at Fremont Bank, and welcome to our first um, Zoom security conference for our consumers um, and clients at the bank. Well, we're really proud to be able to put this on. Um, I think we have some excellent information for all of you today. And uh, I'm coming to you from outside um, in sunny Las Vegas, outside a home <laughs> that the bank is having worked on. So um, forgive my uh, lack of suit and tie today, um, but it's almost, let's see, about 90 degrees already. So nice and warm down here. Um, so uh, relative to our first conference, we will have, um, for those of you that stay on um, from now until the end, we will have a drawing for three prizes, which I'll announce at the end of the, at the conference and uh, take about an hour and a half. Um, and um, we will uh, have copies of the agenda um, as well as the PowerPoint slides can be available to everyone that uh, signs in today. We'll send those out to you. Um, and the chat room is open. So uh, although those of you that are attending, the microphones will all be turned off. Um, please, if you have a question, you can post it in the chat room. Um, uh, my information security um, officer will look at those and uh, we may be able to answer some today before the conference is over, but in some cases we may have to get back to you after the conference. So let me introduce who's gonna be putting the conference on for um, all of us today. But uh, Mark Rhodes Osley, who's our senior vice president in charge of our bank information security, um, uh, just an absolutely incredible find um, for the bank. Um, nine years ago, I was able to bring Mark on board for the bank. Um, Mark comes to us as a professional out of Silicon Valley in the information security field. When I was looking for Mark back then, uh, nine years ago, we had one person working in information security and uh, that person was uh, watching the information coming in from clients as well as our firewalls um, when he was not uh, taking a breakfast break or a lunch break or um, any other uh, information. So we weren't really monitoring 24 um, seven. Since Mark arri Mark's arrival, we've increased that staff to where we're monitoring 24 seven. And Mark will get into a lot of those details for us today. Um, uh, great information about Mark, a funny story, is that I was really trying to recruit Mark I was really doing everything I could to convince him coming to Fremont Bank was a good thing to do. We weren't Google, we weren't Facebook, we weren't Apple, we weren't Amazon, but we had a tremendous challenge for Mark to come into the bank. So in order to get him in, I promised him a wonderful lunch um, the day that I made the offer to him. And on that day at our headquarters, um, the place uh, headquarters was under construction for uh, remodeling. Um, I, I couldn't meet Mark there. I met him actually at one of our branch offices and the closest restaurant to us for being able to go out um, was McDonald's. So I'd like to say it was the happiest meal um, I've ever had because Mark accepted the job um, and joined us. So uh, he is a member of Homeland Security's um, advisory team. He's got a tremendous network out there and uh, he protects both you as customers of the bank, as well as the bank in so many ways. Mark Rhodes Osley, the microphone and platform is yours, sir. Wow, uh, yeah, thank you for the kind words, Chris. Um, <laughs> that was uh, quite an intro. Um, so uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Our purpose here, my purpose here today is to uh, to help equip you hopefully with some knowledge that will help you avoid getting scammed. Uh, so many scams going around these, these days, we see them all at the bank. Um, so as, as Chris pointed out, uh, I'm Mark Rhodes Owsley, I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for the bank. I've been doing cybersecurity for 27, 28 years uh, in, in lots of, lots of companies, high tech companies, uh, Fortune 50 companies, banks, um, and so I've learned a lot over the years and I've, uh, I've written a couple books. Um, and so, uh, so all of that experience hopefully will, will be of some value to you as we go through uh, some of the tips and tricks that I wanna share with you today. Now I will be, as Chris said, monitoring the, uh, the chat here uh, periodically every once in a while, I'll just uh, look over there. 
um, and see what questions are coming in. Um, but I also encourage you to reach out to me directly. So you don't need to, um, you don't need to uh, take notes if you're interested in some of the things that I'm going to show you today, because we're going to send you uh, this whole slide deck. Uh, feel free to, to use it, to read it, share it with your family if there's anything in there you think they should know about. Um, it's basically just a public service that we're providing to you today. Um, if you do have uh, questions for me and you want to reach out to me directly, my email address is mro, as in Mark Rhodes Owsley, at FremontBank.com. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to share with you today, uh, start off with some of the, uh, the tricks that the scammers are using, um, hopefully giving you uh, kind of advanced, advanced warning of what to watch out for. Um, and, and then I'll share with you uh, some of the ways that our clients have been ripped off uh, and have lost, lost money. Uh, we don't want that to happen to you, so hopefully we can learn from some of those experiences. And then finally, I'll share with you uh, my best practices for how to protect yourself and your family. Okay, so let's start off with uh, some of the current scams that we're seeing at the bank and in the industry in general. Um, now, uh, I wanna focus on, on social engineering for a minute. Social engineering is, uh, is, a, is a, a methodology. It's a tool for how scammers operate, how they trick you out of your money. Phishing is one form of social engineering. There are other forms as well, like those phone calls that you get, those robocalls that we all get. Uh, your auto warranty has expired. Anybody get that one? I get a dozen of those a day. Um, a lot of those phone calls are intended to scam you out of your money. Uh, and uh, there's also text messages. Uh, and the text messages are trying to, to trick you as well. All of this is forms of social engineering. How it works is that uh, the scammer will first try to find uh, information that they can use, either um, information about you or maybe a list of potential victims from somewhere that they've uh, collected email addresses or phone numbers. By the way, I'll mention, uh, if you're getting, if you seem to be getting a lot more scam calls today than you were, you know, a few months back, um, that's because of the Facebook breach. Maybe you've heard that uh, Facebook was breached and they, uh, they lost the phone numbers and names of all of, uh, all of us, the billions of people that are on Facebook. Um, so that went up for sale on the dark web. And now the scammers have uh, your phone number, which is why uh, you're getting a lot, of, a lot more calls. Uh, so then they are going to, uh, to present something to you that's either too good to refuse or too fearful to ignore uh, and, and try to trick you into doing something further, either giving them information that will allow them to break into your accounts or maybe plant some malware on your computer that will uh, steal uh, your password and so forth. Um, <clears throat> So there's a methodology for this, and I'm just going to share with you briefly here how it works, how social engineering works, so that maybe you can spot the signs of it when it happens to you. First of all, as I said, they're going to uh, find out information about potential victims. And one of the most uh, effective sources for finding information about potential victims is called OSINT. OSINT. It stands for Open Source Intelligence. What does that mean? Well, it pretty much means Facebook, LinkedIn, any other social media type of sites where you have put information about yourself out there. Maybe your birthday is out there. Maybe your family's names are out there. Now, these scammers can take that information if they can find it and uh, use it against you to try to trick you. Um, there's also classics like shoulder surfing, looking over your shoulder as you're typing something in. And of course, data breaches, all of these data breaches in the last uh, six, seven years that we've been hearing about in the news generally result in a treasure trove of information for hackers and scammers. For example, passwords. We're gonna talk a little bit more about passwords later, but it's important to remember that any password you used 
on any website that was breached is now in the hands of the hackers and they can use that password. So you don't want to be using any old passwords anymore. Okay, then once they have the information, they know what their target looks like, they're going to pretext. In other words, uh, use some form of impersonation or scam in order to, uh, to get you to trust them. And if they do gain your trust, they're going to elicit something from you, namely pulling information from you, or perhaps in some cases, as you'll see, getting direct access to your bank account. All of this is social engineering. It's the same process, whether it's done through an email, a phone call, a text message, uh, or even in person. So here's an example, just to illustrate. You've probably seen something like this before. Uh, here is a, a company that, uh, what looks like a company, it's actually an imposter, but they're saying that they uh, owe you a refund. You overpaid something and they owe you a refund. That's the pretext. This is meant to, to hook you, right? To bait you into interacting with them. Oh, you owe me a refund? Great, I like money. Okay, uh, what do you do? Oh, uh, so they then refund too much money to you and want you to send some of it back. This is a real scam. Uh, and they may even go and uh, try to get your password as well. Um, the problem with this is that uh, if you actually send them money, there's many, many different forms of this scam where you're promised money in return for some portion of money. But the real uh, reality is that, that, that whatever money they're promising you is not going to come to you. Uh, it's going to be fake. But if you send the money to them, it's gone. It's, that is real money. Okay. So uh, another example, maybe you'll recognize this one. And I think this is one of the more important stories to share with your family because I've seen it happen to so many people. Uh, hey, you get a, a, a message, a text message from an unknown phone number, only it's coming from a friend of yours who says, oh, I just got a new phone. Now, wait a minute, how do they know your friend's name? Think back to what I was just saying about information gathering and open source intelligence. They probably know your friend's name from social media, maybe Facebook, something like that. So now this person is uh, impersonating somebody that you may know. And they say, hey, I uh, just got mugged or I got in an accident or I got arrested. There's different flavors of it, but they all come down to the same thing. Can you send me some money? And I'm sure you're probably thinking, yeah, I wouldn't fall for that, right? Uh, surely there's ways to confirm if your friend is really in trouble. But again, this happens to a lot of people. This happened to my father-in-law. My father-in-law sent $800 to a scammer uh, because of this exact trick, despite all of the warnings that I give all the time over the family dinner table. Um, it's just that these, these social engineering tricks are very, very effective. They're very effective. They get you to act before you think. Now here, coincidentally, is an example. Again, you're probably going to look at this and think, well, I would never fall for that. But uh, this is an example that just came to me yesterday from a friend. A friend of mine showed me this and said, hey, look at this, uh, look at this uh, formal looking notification I got. It says that uh, uh, you want a million dollars in the Canadian Powerball jackpot uh, now, you might want to stop and think, did you actually enter a Canadian jackpot? And if you read further, it says that uh, uh, you want to contact our office in South Africa. Why would the Canadian Powerball jackpot have an office in South Africa? Who knows? But this is a real scam. And believe it or not, we've seen customers fall for this scam too. They send a portion of money to the scammer because they think they're going to get a million dollars and the million dollars never shows up. And then they call us and say, Hey, where's my million dollars? I was expecting that two days ago. Well, the fact is you're never going to get the million dollars, but the money you sent is gone. So that, those are just a couple examples. Here are the top 10 scams that we're seeing right now. Um, there are our credit offers, uh, loan offers, 
that uh, uh, advertise very low rates or pre-approval. That's a very common one. The lottery scam is what I just showed you. Uh, I, you know, that was on the list before I actually got that example yesterday. Um, so watch out for that one. You know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Uh, the online dating one is also very, very common. We see it a lot and it's very effective. Uh, you know, a, a scammer will create an online dating profile that looks very attractive and uh, engage a victim in, in chatting and uh, gain their trust and then ask them for money. Uh, number four is the fake antivirus. Maybe you've seen this one. Uh, it's telling you that uh, your computer uh, is infected and you have to uh, download something that is actually a virus. Uh, and, and this is a, a big phone scam too. We see lots and lots of people for falling, falling for this over the phone where uh, they get a phone call and it's from Microsoft or it's from uh, Best Buy, you know, that we've heard about. Uh, a lot of companies being impersonated, they call you and say, hey, uh, there's a problem on your computer, we're going to fix it for you. Only they're actually hackers and they're planting malware so that they can then try to break into your bank account. Uh, the subscription one is huge right now. This probably should be number one on the list at this point. Maybe you've seen it. Uh, it says that, hey, your subscription has been automatically renewed. Subscription to some antivirus software, or it varies, the flavors vary, but it basically says, hey, you know, $99 has been uh, uh, debited from your account uh, automatically uh, per your subscription. And they're, uh, what they're doing is, again, social engineering, they're trying to get you to call them, uh, contact them. So, you, you know, you're going to call and say, hey, I want my money back. I didn't sign up for this, but then they're going to uh, continue to try to scam you. So watch out for that one. If you get a notice saying that your subscription has been automatically renewed, don't believe it. Uh, the tech support scams, uh, you know, very similar to uh, the, the fake antivirus. Basically, again, generally it's a phone call these days. Generally it's a phone call. You get a call, it says, hi, I'm a representative of such and such company. Uh, I'm here to fix your computer. We do have lots of, of customers who fall for that. And what I tell them is, if you let hackers into your computer, you should no longer use that computer. It's compromised. Consider it compromised. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more too. Um, <clears throat> the overpayment scam, very similar uh, to what I was talking about earlier uh, with the social engineering. Uh, so it, it, this is especially uh, susceptible for people that are selling things online. If you're selling something online and you get somebody uh, overpaying you for it and asked to send the difference, their payment is going to bounce, guaranteed. Uh, another one, uh, similar to the subscription service, we see a lot of this one too. Uh, hey, your Amazon account just purchased a $1,200 gaming chair or a $1,800 big screen TV. And uh, because of the human nature, people will panic when they see this. And immediately go click a link, right? Um, which is malicious. Um, I'm sure everybody's familiar with Facebook impersonation. Uh, somebody goes to Facebook and uh, makes a fake account in the name of one of your friends, and then invites everybody to to join them to friend them. Uh, maybe they copy the person's uh, profile picture, so you think it's them. Most people are catching on to the, this particular scam these days. I see it all the time. I see people uh, on Facebook saying, hey, there's a fake you out there. You know, and then you contact Facebook to get them to take it down. Um, finally, number 10, I think this is worth mentioning. Um, people will get a threatening email that threatens to expose intimate personal details of you. And uh, because of the nature of this particular scam, people are too embarrassed to say anything or bring it up. Uh, and uh, they're more inclined to believe it. And this is a pure extortion scam. These scammers just want you to send them money so that they won't leak intimate personal details of you online. But again, it's fake. They don't have the, they don't have the details. Okay, I'm gonna pause here.
to check the, uh, the chat. Let's see if I can get over to that. There we go. Um, where's the chat window? All right, let me come back to this. All right, I'll come back to that in a minute. All right. Uh, there are some uh, coronavirus themed scams to watch out for too. Now these I think are tapering off a little bit more these days, um, but it's still worth being aware of these particular scams. Um, <clears throat> number one, just cracks me up every time. Uh, it, it's The scam says that uh, there's a special computer antivirus software that can pre prevent you from getting COVID. Um, there's, uh, uh, the fake stimulus checks and all you have to do is give them your bank account number to get one of these fake stimulus checks. Uh, believe it or not, there's an extortion thread out there of basically, Hey, somebody's going to intentionally infect you with COVID if you don't pay them. Uh, there were plenty of fake COVID-19 websites uh, you could pay money to presumably go see the infections. These things cropped up like weeds, uh, especially during the early days of the pandemic. There were also lots of scams uh, purporting to come from the World Health Organization. Of course, they were imposters. And uh, the home testing kits were another, another big one that was popular with the scammers. So a recent study did find that 20% of people uh, had received a COVID-related scam call. Now, uh, these days, uh, as, as I see it, the COVID themes are, are kind of tapering off, but the scam calls continue. And in general, best practice for scam phone calls, uh, or really any phone call that you don't recognize, first of all, just don't, don't answer it. And if you did answer it, just hang up, right? Um, these robocalls that come through are trying to find live victims to connect with scammers. So if you don't pick up at all, or if you just hang up after you hear the first few words, uh, they're not going to consider you a potential victim. Um, and if it is a scammer, of course, it's not rude to hang up on them. It's rude for them to call you. So uh, here's number three here is what I do. It's, unfortunately, it's come to this, and I hate to say it, but it has come to this. Uh, if I get a phone call and uh, I don't recognize the number, I don't answer it, I let it go to voicemail, and um, then I listen to the voicemail. I would say about two or three out of every 10 calls I get is uh, a real one. So I listen to the voicemail, I call them right back. Um, but the other seven out of 10 are uh, scams or sales pitches that I don't want. So uh, that's the world, unfortunately, that we live in. Um, if you do have a home landline, there are some pretty cool call blocking devices out there. I have one uh, in my house. Um, it basically has a database in it of known phone numbers that scammers use, and, and not just scammers, but sal salespeople or uh, robocallers. Um, and so it'll, it'll block those calls and they won't ring through to you. Um, and these devices can also, if you want, block anonymous calls uh, if they don't have any caller ID. And uh, uh, you can also do this on the iPhone. You can set your iPhone to block anonymous calls. Um, you know, that's, that's not for everybody, right? If you really don't want to hear from uh, people you don't know, it might be a good option for you. But sometimes important calls are anonymous. Uh, could be, uh, you know, you're joining a meeting or something like that, uh, or it could be, you know, a notification from your your uh, medical institution, something like that. Um, so uh, 
finally, you know, again, all of these social engineering tricks are trying to get you to, to send money to the scammer. And the most common form of currency these days for scammers is gift cards because it's very easy and very anonymous. They trick people into going down to their local Walmart or Target or any place that sells gift cards, uh, buy up, you know, $500, uh, $500 cards, as many as the scammer is demanding. And then, um, uh, you know, you, they, you scratch off, you scratch off the, the number off the back of the card and read it off to the scammer. And then the scammer now has a $500 gift card. Uh, this is their, their currency of choice because it's totally untraceable. Nobody can find out where that, that uh, code went to. All right, let me pause for a moment to check for more questions. <laughs> Darius, that's that's a good one. That's funny. Yeah, yeah. The IRS. Oh, right. The social. Yes, social security. So your social security card will be uh, deactivated or uh, declined. Or you know, if you don't if you don't call us back, that's a that's a big one. That's a, a huge one right now. The social security card and your social security number. Yeah, um, lots of. Uh, um, uh, lots of lots of that going around. Okay, here's a question: What is the purpose of calls where you pick up and there's silence at the other end for a short time? Well, because what it is, that's a automated dialing service, and it's dialing every phone number in existence. And uh, if it does, if the number doesn't pick up, it'll move on to the next number. But if if it picks up, this is a this is a software that's running. It's going to wait for a few seconds to, to make sure that you're actually a live person and they're gonna connect you to the scammer automatically. So if you pick up for some reason uh, and you don't, you don't hear anything, you better hang up right away unless you wanna get connected to a scammer. Um, Patty is asking if uh, scammers are trying to capture our voice for voice recognition. Um, you know, that's pretty rare and it's very ineffective. It doesn't really work. You know, if they try to record your voice and then play it back later, maybe to your bank, uh, it's just not natural speech and it's not something that uh, really works in a social engineering scam. So that's not a big one right now. All right, thank you for the questions. Let me uh, go ahead and move on and I'll check again uh, in a few minutes there. All right. So um, <clears throat> let's talk about, you know, one of the common themes here that I hope you're hearing is that scammers will impersonate somebody that you know. And uh, they can do this very easily on email. And there's two ways that they can pretend to be somebody that you know on email. One is to set up a, a, you know, a new Gmail account with that person's name and maybe a number on it. And again, where did they get this information? How did they know that was your friend or your boss? Uh, well, they, they did it through uh, open source intelligence. They found that information out there because they're targeting you. So now they've created an email address that has uh, a, a person that you're familiar with is the name. It's not really them. Most commonly, this particular impersonation trick is used to trick businesses. Businesses that uh, uh, you know have some money and uh, the scammer pretends to be the CEO or the president of the business. And then uh, we'll use that email address to contact uh, one of the employees of the company and say, hey, I need this wire transfer sent immediately to this account. And believe it or not, again, we see a lot of our business customers falling for this particular scam. It actually is even more effective if, uh, this, if, if the scammer actually can get into your real email. Maybe this has happened to you or some of your friends. I've seen it happen where uh, somehow a person is probably using a password to get to their email that they use somewhere else and it's been breached. Now the hacker logs in 
as you and goes through your contact list and sends emails out to uh, all of your friends or all of your coworkers. Um, or maybe then again, we'll just try to impersonate the CEO of a company and tell one of the employees to wire some money. So there's a difference between impersonation and account takeover. Impersonation is a little easier to spot, especially if you're familiar with the person's real email address. If it's coming from uh, uh, Gmail, especially if it's like a, just a random name, Gmail or Hotmail or something like that, um, you might be able to spot it by looking at the address. Um, <clears throat> the account takeover scenario is becoming more common and we're seeing that's climbing up towards 50% of the uh, email impersonation cases that we see. So bottom line, never trust email. Uh, just don't trust it, right? If you get an email um, and it seems urgent and maybe it's uh, from somebody you think you know, you definitely want to contact that person and find out more. Maybe let them know that their email has been hacked or that they're being impersonated. Um, but double check, call them on the phone or text them or something like that. Why can't we stop this? Isn't it illegal? That's a question I get all the time. Um, for, for numerous reasons, uh, the answer is no, it can't be stopped, uh, not without intervention from some of the major email service providers uh, like Google, um, and they're not doing that. So basically anybody's allowed to sign up for any account for free. Sure, strictly speaking, the letter of the law may say that impersonating somebody for fraud purposes is against the law, but there's no easy way to find them. You'd have to get a subpoena, go to Google, show harm, get a search warrant, all those things. There just aren't resources to do that. So these guys pretty much have free reign. So uh, also watch out for the, um, the elicitation. If you get an email that wants you to take some immediate action and seems to have some urgency to it, you should probably stop and think and be suspicious about it. Now, I wanna share with you this, we're moving into section two here. Um, let's see if we have any more questions coming through. I don't see any right now. Okay, um, a couple of examples, because maybe you're thinking at this point, I know I would be uh, thinking, uh, well, okay, aren't these pretty obvious? Who would fall for this? Here's some of our real customers that uh, and this is what's happened to them. Uh, this customer uh, got a call from Best Buy and uh, they provided, uh, she provided them with her, her uh, bank account information and uh, access to her computer. And it was only later after the fact that she found out it was a scam. Um, <clears throat> I wanna make one important point here though when something like this happens, maybe it's happened to you, maybe it's happened to somebody in your family. Um, you, if, if your computer is compromised, you really shouldn't use that computer anymore, especially not for banking. And by extension, what I advise people, best practice is for, for your banking, uh, if you're doing online banking, it's very, very important. You should have, if possible, a dedicated computer just for banking not the same computer that your kids are using because the kids may be installing all kinds of software on there. You don't know. Um, it may have a virus. It could have software on it that uh, will steal passwords. Um, if you can do it, it's best practice to have a computer just for banking. Don't use it for anything else. And that's especially true if you've had a situation like this where uh, a computer was compromised. All right. Um, <clears throat> Here's another variation of the lottery scam. Uh, this customer got a phone call from a radio station, radio station telling her she won half a million dollars. All they need is her bank account number to process the transfer. So she gave them happily the information um, as well as her debit card information. And, and this is one of the ones who called us saying, hey, I'm expecting this half a million dollars to show up in my account, where is it? Uh, we had to unfortunately, sadly inform her of, of the scam uh, so what we do in these situations is we give a person a brand new bank account since the old one is compromised. Much like you would have a new uh, credit card number if your credit card number is compromised. 
all right, here's a customer. Remember what I said about gift cards? This customer uh, uh, bought two $500 gift cards from Target and insisted that it was a gift for a friend. Our associate uh, was suspicious about this. That's not normal. Do people normally give $1,000 of gift cards to a friend? Because it sure sounds like a scam, right? It's pretty much exactly the pattern of a scam. Uh, well, this uh, customer finally admitted that uh, he got a text message saying somebody purchased an expensive TV with his Amazon account. And uh, this was that scam I was telling you about earlier, mixed with a little bit of extortion. Uh, the scammer convinced him that if he wanted to lock down his Amazon account so this couldn't happen again, he had to pay them using gift cards. Uh, most of these scams that I'm telling you about, if people lose money to fraud of this nature, uh, depending on what happens specifically, we usually will consider that victim assisted fraud, which means that it's not protected under regulations and uh, un these unfortunate victims are not entitled to getting reimbursed from their bank. So prevention is really the best uh, way to avoid these situations. All right, let's see what we got in the chat here. Oh, okay. Uh, Danielle, I see you're uh, bringing up Nomo Robo. Um, uh, that's a that's a very good point. So this is back to the uh, uh, how do you stop scam calls topic. Uh, Nomo Robo was a pretty cool service that I used for a while to block robocalls on um, on landlines or VoIP lines. Um, there are a couple uh, services that are still available for the iPhone. Uh, one of them uh, that I used to recommend to everybody uh, is called Haya. H-I-Y-A. Um, you may be writing that down. That's a good service that uh, uh, is very effective at blocking scam calls on mobile phones. Uh, may still be available on Android devices, Samsung phones. Um, now, it was so effective that AT&T uh, essentially bought it for use with the AT&T wireless service. So if you have an AT&T service on your phone, uh, they have their own branded version of Haya. It's called AT&T Call Protect. It's pretty neat. Depending on how restrictive you want to be, uh, you can set it up to uh, block any calls that aren't in your contacts already, uh, or you can set it to block calls that come from your local area code and prefix, right? Uh, that's a common scammer trick too. They, they use a service to uh, make their phone number look really close to yours so it seems like it's coming from uh, somebody near you, probably someone you know. All right. I think we have another question here. Oh, how do you know your computer is compromised? Well, the most common way that our customers uh, find out is that they see the mouse moving on its own on the screen. That's never a good sign. If your mouse is moving on its own, uh, that's not normal. Um, other, you know, other unusual or strange computer behaviors can be an indicator to uh, if, if the computer is crashing or if it's loading software that you don't recognize or if windows are popping up and maybe going away quickly. Those are potential signs. Um, if something like that happens to you, uh, I would recommend that you take it to a uh, computer repair type service, Best Buy, Geek Squad, or uh, Staples has one. There's quite a few out there um, to check your computer, make sure it's not infected. Uh, okay. All right, let's go ahead and move go on. Ahead. What's that? Chris, did you have a comment? Yeah, hey, Mark, I was, what I was just gonna say was I was looking in the chat room. I saw somebody asked about um, the measures we're using on um, if someone calls in and wants a large cashier's check or moving money um, on our consumer accounts um, versus business accounts. So on our business accounts, 
um, we have our customers sign in and, and establish a relationship with us where they actually can do wires and ACH and move funds. Um, but we go through a very um, strict process of verification on those and it requires um, out of band authentication. Um, for consumers, we are not going to take a phone call or an email from you to move money. Um, that's not what's going to happen. And if it's a large cashier's check, um, or if you want a large wire, or you want to create a new ACH, um, you, that's going to go through our security system, it's going to go through our fraud system, and we will be in touch with you directly. I know Patty Greenup's on the line with us right now, um, who's in uh, our operations, but uh, we do a ton of verification before we take money, large money out and move it. So um, on your online banking, um, you can move money between your accounts and you can move money out to another bank, but it, we still scrub that data before it goes um, over certain denominations. So I just wanted to spend a couple seconds on that, Mark, that's all. Sure, thanks, Chris. Yeah, that's, that's important information. Um, okay, so uh, section three here, as I mentioned, uh, when I was showing you the, uh, the agenda outline, uh, what can you do to protect yourself? Now that maybe, uh, hopefully you have some awareness of some of the scams that are really active right now to watch out for, what should you be doing to protect yourself? Um, first of all, let me start by what we do is your bank to protect you. Uh, we have a lot higher quality of security than most uh, other companies in general and many other banks. Why is that? Well, we've invested millions of dollars in advanced cybersecurity technology because we value uh, keeping your information and your account secure and safe. Uh, we believe that we owe you that because of the trust you place in us of being a customer of the bank. Um, and also because of my experience, my 27 years of experience in the industry, I know what uh, we should be doing to protect you. So here's some of the things, just a quick list. Um, we have a very advanced firewall protecting our website. Uh, it gives us great visibility into attacks that, that uh, uh, come in from the internet. We also have geo-blocking, which kind of goes along with that. Geo-blocking means that uh, we block certain countries from accessing our website. The reason for that is because when we detect attacks coming from uh, those countries uh, and, and, and hostile countries as defined by the US government, um, we see them trying to log into your account. And most commonly they're using something called credential stuffing, which means that they're trying to log in to an account based on a password that has been breached. They have huge lists of millions of passwords. They're plugging them in to see if any of them work. Um, and so we block entire countries because of that hostile attack activity. What that means to you is that uh, if you travel to a country that we consider hostile, um, that we're blocking, you will not be able to get to our website from there. However, um, if that happens to you, you'll get a clear, clear message saying exactly what's happening. You're getting blocked because you're in this country and we blocked that country without have a phone number to call. Uh, if you find yourself in that situation, you can use the mobile app. The Fremont Bank mobile app will work everywhere around the world. Uh, the reason for that is that it's, it's very, very secure and um, it's not exposed to the same types of attacks uh, that our web servers are. Web servers are exposed to uh, a lot of threats that can lead to uh, people's accounts getting taken over. Um, we have the green, the green bar at the top of your browser. When you go to FremontBank.com, you can see that it's been verified and trusted. We also have a very cool thing that almost no other banks or companies have, the ability to detect malware on your computer. The question earlier was, how do I know if my computer's infected? Um, if you come to our website, we would know because uh, we have a special tool that can check for infections and especially things like banking trojans, uh, which are designed to steal money from people's online accounts. Um, so if, uh, if, if you are uh, uh, using a computer that's uh, 
uh, infected, we can give you a call and let you know. That's very advanced stuff. Um, we have multi-factor authentication, of course, that's an absolute must in this world of uh, passwords that are, uh, are just not enough to protect the account. Um, and trusted device ID is nice because uh, the way that multi-factor works is you have to get a code, you have to put in a code um, when you log in from a new device. That's to make sure it isn't somebody else trying to log into your account. But if it's really you, you can say trust this device. And that way you can continue using that device without having to put in a code every time. Um, account alerts, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a little bit more detail on account alerts because I think it's very, very important. And it's the best tool in the toolbox for protecting your bank account. We'll see why in a minute. Um, transaction limits are there to make sure that fraudsters can't steal uh, all of your money. They, if they steal some of your money, there's a limit to how much they can take. We also have very advanced uh, artificial intelligence based fraud detection that looks at normal patterns of activity for your account and uh, will alert us if suddenly you know there's a there's a, a money transfer coming out of your account that's never been done before we would have the opportunity to intervene call you and stop that if it's uh, if, it, if it's not authorized down at the bottom here uh, I gave you a link to our resource center uh, where there's a lot more information about this sort of thing and things that you can do to protect yourself. Again, uh, don't worry about trying to jot down the link here. Uh, we're gonna send you these, uh, these slides so you'll have all this information in your hands. All right, any more uh, questions come up? Let me take a look here. No, okay. All right. Mark, I'm, I'm dealing with the elder abuse question, so I'm answering that right now. Go ahead. Oh, you're answering it uh, privately? Okay. All right. I want to talk about these alerts because, um, like I said, this is one of the, one of the most uh, powerful tools in the toolbox. Uh, we provide these alerts to you, and you can get to them through the mobile app. Uh, if you want to take a look at, uh, uh, at these alerts as I'm talking about them, there's a QR code right there on the screen. What's a QR code? You probably know already. Uh, you can open up your phone's camera, okay, and hold it up to that code, and it will ask you if you want to open this link. And if you say yes, it will take you to our mobile app on the official mobile app store. So this is a way for you to be sure that you can trust that this is the real Fremont Bank mobile app and not some kind of imposter. Um, so if you go and you get the app and you log in, uh, there are lots of alerts here um, that I think are very, very useful. We have some alerts that we provide to you automatically, you don't have to opt into them uh, if your password has been changed. That's something that's very important for you to know, right? Uh, that way you can be sure that nobody else is out there changing your password, it's only you. Uh, likewise, if your contact information, your login ID are changed, uh, your profile, you know, your address, your phone number especially, things like that are changed, you get an alert. Uh, you'll get an alert if somebody changes your password through the forgot password option. And you'll get an alert if the alerts themselves are changed. Okay, these are the ones that we provide to you. But you have a lot of optional alerts. And personally, I have turned on every single one of these on my bank account. Um, it, it tends to be a lot of information coming at you, right? Because every time I log in to my bank account, I get a bunch of alerts. Um, I get alerts that say I logged into my account. I get an alert that says my password is valid. Um, and uh, I get alerts then on other things that I do. Uh, for example, if I transfer money, there's an alert for that. Uh, if you were to add another bank account into your list of accounts that you could transfer money to, that is an optional alert. Um, if the uh, if somebody tried to change your password and failed, there's an optional alert for that. Um, 
valid password submitted. Yep, that, every single time I log in, I get, hey, valid password. Okay, but that's good because I want to know if somebody, uh, if, if I ever get an alert that I wasn't expecting something's going on. Um, so these alerts are available to you optionally, the ones on the right here. And there's a lot more information in the two links that I'm providing at the bottom of the page here if you want to know more about these alerts, uh, as well as other uh, optional uh, uh, features that we offer. Okay, so uh, let's pause here and see what's going on in the chat. All right, quite a few questions here. I'm trying to pick something that I think everybody would be interested in hearing. Yeah, you know what, uh, folks, uh, a lot of good questions there. I'm gonna go ahead and, and move forward um, with the material here, but uh, I encourage you to contact me directly if I haven't answered your question. Uh, MRO at FremontBank.com. I welcome your correspondence. Um, okay, so uh, how can you make sure that, uh, uh, that you're really going to your bank's website or using their, their app? The green bar that I mentioned is, uh, is an important uh, trust indicator. You see green bar at the top of your screen. Uh, that means that a lot of work has gone into validating that that site is safe and secure. Um, I recommend that uh, people bookmark important uh, links like FremontBank.com so you don't type it in every time because people do sometimes make typos and sometimes those typos can take you someplace you really don't want to go. Uh, if you're downloading a mobile app, any mobile app, but especially a bank's mobile app, uh, you absolutely wanna make sure that you're getting it from the Apple uh, store, the official Apple store or the official Google store because there are fake, uh, there are fake apps out there that hackers can't put them in these official stores because security's too good. But if, if anybody's trying to get apps from an unofficial source, it's very likely those apps are gonna be malicious. Um, now using a good password, you know, I, I'm sure you're thinking, most people think, uh, okay, you're telling me that passwords have been breached and I can't use that same password I, I used to use, but it's very hard to come up with a new password. Uh, so, so the trick that I uh, recommend to everybody is to put some words together, use whole words. They call this a passphrase. Um, you look at the uh, number five here on the page, I give you some examples of, uh, of ways to use whole words to make a password. And the longer, the better. The longer the password is, the more secure it is. However, another best practice that I'm gonna give you is that you should use a different password everywhere. If you use the same password in more than one website, you're risking that that website is gonna get breached and that password then can be used on other websites that you use it on. Um, and most people think, well, I can't even remember one password. How am I gonna remember a lot of passwords? Uh, and my, my advice is to get a password manager. A password manager uh, is a secure vault and stores all of your passwords. Uh, it's secure, it's encrypted. Um, the ones that, uh, so I use Dashlane myself. I've been using it for many years. Um, LastPass is another one. I like Dashlane because it's family friendly. Uh, it fills in your passwords for you. It's, it's very easy. It fills in contact information. Uh, you don't have to be particularly technical to use it. It costs uh, $20 a year. Um, and I think it's well worth it. LastPass is free, but it's uh, it's got a lot more features, but it's, uh, um, a little less intuitive in my opinion. So, uh, um, you know, best suited for people that are technically inclined. And there are some other good ones out there. 
Um, but the, the reason why it's important to use a password manager, it's a good idea to use one, is uh, first of all, then you can have different passwords everywhere. It doesn't matter because you don't need to know those passwords anymore. It will put them in for you. You just have a single master password that you have to remember. Uh, now, that master password is very important. A lot of people worry that, what if I forget my master password? Now I don't have access to any of my passwords. What do I do? Well, uh, actually, it's not that hard. Every single website in the world has a forgot password link that makes it very easy for you to change your password uh, if somehow you've lost access to it. Um, people also worry about how much work it would be to set up a password manager, right? I personally have well over 300 passwords in Dashlane, well over 300. And uh, the good news is that I didn't have to type any of those in. It automatically will ask you, when you log into a website, it'll ask you, uh, do you want to save this password? You say yes, it goes into the, the vault. Um, if later on you decide you want to change your password, which is a good practice, uh, many, many websites are supported in Dashlane uh, to automatically change it. Dashlane will take care of that for you. It'll find the right page. It'll put in the password for you. Um, and the nice thing about that is that um, once you get to a, a, a level of uh, comfort and confidence and uh, expertise with a password manager, you can then start using random passwords. That's the level that I'm at. Uh, I don't know any of my passwords. I don't need to know them. So they're completely random, completely random. Uh, what if something were to happen and uh, uh, I can't log into my Fremont bank account, um, something's wrong with the password or I forgot, you know, something, something happened to the password database, whatever. Um, I don't know my password, what do I do? Very, very easy. I just uh, use the forgot password link and I make new password. Um, and every time you do something like that, Dashlane and the other password managers will ask you if you want it to make a password for you. And I always say yes. Wow, you know, there are some great questions coming in. Um, I just don't have time to go into some of these great, great subjects, great topics, um, unfortunately, but I will take note of some of those questions for future sessions. Uh, we, this is our first, uh, first ever uh, consumer focused cybersecurity seminar. We do expect to do more of these in the future. Um, so, uh, here are some tips for you. Uh, let's see. For computers, uh, of course, never, number one here is actually worth noting. Okay. Maybe it seems obvious. Never share your information, your password, security questions, things like that. But guess what people are doing all day long? I see it on Facebook all day long. They're taking quizzes. Uh, and these quizzes are eliciting personal information. What was the first car you learned to drive stick shift in? Or, uh, you know, things like that that are uh, potential answers to security questions. And these quiz makers are actually building large databases of personal information that could potentially be used uh, to answer security questions. Um, very, very important also is to keep all your software and your windows up to date. You know, my wife hates it. Every time she sits down to use a piece of software, it says, do you want to update? No, she says, just, I want to use it. And then at the end of the day, or in the, especially in the early morning, uh, she boots up the computer and it says, Windows needs to restart for an update. And she always says, no. But the correct answer is actually, yes. You got to keep it all up to date because there are security vulnerabilities in there that these vendors are fixing and you have to install them for them to be effective. Um, I mentioned they don't use a shared computer for banking. Not everybody has that option. But um, if you do, if you have more than one computer, uh, you really, I recommend that you consider um, putting aside one computer that you only use for banking, especially if you do it fairly often. Um, now, mind you, for mobile app banking, it's a little bit of a different story. First of all, you should be keeping your phone safe and secure. Uh, 
you you should also, for the same reason as with your computer, you should keep your your uh, your phone's operating system up to date and make sure that all the apps on the phone are uh, automatically updating themselves. All those updates are full of security fixes. Um, and if you have a passcode, like I have a passcode on, on my phone, so uh, you know you can't get into it without the passcode, but I use the face ID and the face ID will unlock the phone for me. Uh, even though uh, it has a passcode, I don't always have to use the passcode. Um, that's important for, you know, if you lose your phone, right? And it gets, falls into the hands of somebody else, uh, they can't get in and start messing with your apps. Okay. Um, what I want to get to now, though, is, is the security of the mobile app versus the security of the website. Is there a question there? Did I hear a voice? Okay. People ask me, uh, is the mobile app really secure? How secure is it? For some reason, people are less trusting of a mobile app than they are of a website. Um, but they don't need to be less trusting of a mobile app because a mobile app is actually more secure than a website. Why is that? Well, first of all, again, because of the, uh, the biometric capabilities that it has, uh, pretty much guarantees that the person using the device is you. Um, you also have typically better control over your phone than you might have over a computer. This, this is my phone, it's right here with me. It's either in my pocket, on my desk. Uh, whereas my computer may be in the same physical location unless I take it somewhere and somebody steals it, um, but it's more prone to, to malware. Um, and, and malware just doesn't affect phones as much as computers. That's not to say that it, you know, malware is not an issue on phones. It's just much less prevalent. It really depends on what you're doing, what your behaviors are. If you're only downloading trustworthy apps and not clicking on any links that come in through a text message, you're pretty much guaranteed that your phone is secure. Uh, whereas on a computer, there are lots more ways for a computer to get a virus. Um, so as long as you're safe and secure with your with your phone, um, I consider it to be a more secure way to do your online banking. All right, do we have additional questions that I wanna pick up right now? Let's take a look. Hey Mark, this is Chris. Um, I know a lot of us use USB drives, plugging them into our computers moving them around, uh, finding one um, in a drawer. Can you deal with just uh, talk a little bit about how to clean those or throw them away before you use them? Um, but I think that's a question I know that comes up often. Um, yeah, well, so USB sticks are potentially dangerous things. USB sticks can, um, can have viruses that get on them. Um, if you have a USB stick in a computer and the computer has a virus, sometimes that virus will spread to the stick. Um, and so uh, any given USB stick uh, could be risky. Uh, if you find a USB stick, it could have been planted maliciously. Uh, somebody could have left it there with a virus on it. Uh, that really does happen. Um, if you find an old USB stick that you're not sure what's on it, um, just be careful. It's not... Uh, it's not always safe, right? Um, should you throw it away? Absolutely. <laughs> I would say yes. Those things are pretty cheap. And uh, unless you're worried about throwing away some important data that you might have on there, any old USB sticks are probably best put in the trash. We did have one other question come up from James that I think I'll, uh, I'll address here. Good question. Um, what about uh, staying logged in? Staying logged in. So when you log into a website, and you can't do this with a bank because banks don't let you, but many websites like Facebook, for example, will let you stay logged in. Um, I have to admit, I do uh, for, for accounts like that, that, you know, I, I'm not concerned about, um, I stay logged in. There is a certain level of risk to that, right? If somebody were to walk in and uh, get access to your computer, they could pretend to be you. 
And in practice, that's fairly rare because they'd have to be in your house or your place of business. Um, but it's, it's hypothetically possible. So what I do is, it, you know, if, if it's unimportant, if I'm not worried about the particular website, I stay logged in. Um, but if it is important, like if I'm trading stocks or doing online banking or something like that, uh, I always log out. Um, I always log out manually. I click the log out, just make sure I'm logged out. Um, okay. One cool thing you can do, I don't know if everybody knows this, but uh, you can go on Facebook and some of the other sites and look at the information about you that is presented to the rest of the world. You could see your account through an outsider's perspective. They have a feature that lets you go um, and do that so that you can see how much information you're maybe unintentionally oversharing about yourself beyond your friends. Um, you should also be careful. You know, I have to give my wife credit. She uh, put a fake birthday in Facebook. So every year she gets a happy birthday on a day that's not her birthday. But that is actually turned out to be really smart because uh, the scammers, social engineering I was telling you about, a birthday is a very important piece of personal information. Uh, birthday is one of those things that you get asked when you call in uh, or when you're trying to authenticate to something. Um, so be careful what you share on social media. Uh, I think it's too late for me. I put my real birthday in, that's my bad. Um, maybe I could change it now, but it's probably already out there. And if you have the opportunity to use multi-factor authentication on, on a website, uh, you absolutely should. Now, uh, I'm talking about any website, like Facebook, for example, um, has multi-factor authentication. So does Instagram. It's very basically in a very simple form. If you're uh, logging in from somewhere you haven't logged in before, uh, it will either pop up on your phone through the app or send you a code saying, is this really you? Are you trying to log in? Yes, it's me. Um, so, uh, you know, this, this will also prevent hackers from taking over your account. That account takeover I was talking about can be prevented with multi-factor authentication because even if they get your password, they still can't get into your account without your approval. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, watch out for fake accounts on social media too. I think at this point in time, most people are uh, familiar enough with fake accounts that they could spot them. Uh, email though continues to be a challenge, right? When it comes to phishing, uh, uh, you know, people tend to be overconfident. They tend to uh, think, hey, I, you know, I can spot a scam a mile away. But yet I see people all the time falling for these scams on email. Um, so it's important to be mindful when you're looking at email, who's it coming from, right? Is it coming from somebody I know? And take a look, take a closer look at the email address it came from. Does that look right to you or is it something more random? What is the email trying to get you to do? Does it feel like it's a licitation? Does it feel like it's threatening or maybe super urgent? Um, you know, those are red flags. Have you received emails like that before? The guy who got scammed because of the expensive Amazon purchase, he could have used this advice, right? When uh, he got that email, he could have thought, is this something that uh, I've seen before? Because if you haven't, something's not right. The goal of the scammer is to trick you and scare you and startle you and stop your thought process, right? Uh, and get you to take an action without thinking. Uh, what do you do with these things when you get them? You get a scam email, what should you do? Well, uh, your best bet is just to ignore it and delete it. Don't worry about it, don't respond to it, don't report it. Um, you, you basically just can delete it and ignore it and, and treat it like a robocall. Treat it like a robocall. How you doing? You want to watch this with me? All right. This? So, um, you know, I think everyone knows the trick that uh, you can hover over a link in an email uh, to see where it's taking you, right? Just um, move the mouse cursor and, and don't click it, just hold it there and uh, it'll pop up with where the link is going. You can do the same thing on a phone. 
if there's a link that you get uh, in an email or uh, uh, a text message or something like that on your phone, the trick is to push the link with your finger, okay, and hold it. That'll pop up where the link is actually going. Push and hold, as opposed to tapping it. Um, number two here, I want to emphasize as well. It's very important to um, to avoid searching as much as possible. You want to go. You want to go to Google and search for, let's say, FremontBank.com. You're better off typing in FremontBank.com into your browser. Why? Because search engines are uh, are poisoned all the time. They're poisoned with fake, fake sites. So if you're going to go to like say chase.com, we've seen this happen, chase.com, go to Google type in chase.com. The first thing that'll come up is a fake website, not the real one. Why does Google allow that to happen? Because they get paid and that's what their business model is. Um, although they will take it down if there are complaints. So what if you get an email from supposedly one of your friends who wants $800, get them out of a bind? Um, you should call your friend. Hey, I just got this email, said it was from you, said you're in trouble, call. Don't engage on the same media that you're uh, initially getting the message from. So don't email them back. Um, and just remember social engineers use these mind tricks because they're effective. Okay, so I'm going to be uh, moving into the, the home stretch here, about to cross the finish line. Um, and I want to leave you with this, uh, what I consider to be one of my most important recommendations. This is regarding credit fraud. What can you do to stop people from opening up lines of credit in your name and in uh, your children's name on their credit records? Uh, if you place all, all of the, uh, the credit bureaus will allow you to place a security freeze. A lot of people have heard of fraud alerts. Not everybody's heard about a security freeze. Security freeze means that nobody can open up a new line of credit under your identity, as long as the freeze is active. Um, this became actually uh, more widely known and more common after the big Equifax breach, and it also became free. You used to have to pay to get a security freeze. Now it's free. Um, so what you do is you go to the you go to the uh, the credit bureau, and they will have an option there for you to place a freeze on uh, your credit. And you can follow the steps that I've outlined here. Um, and if you go through these steps, you'll end up with a uh, a code, a special code, and your credit is now locked. Nobody can mess with your credit. It's completely frozen, completely locked, until such time as you want to use your credit. Uh, you want to open up a new line of credit. And so uh, at that point, you can lift the security freeze or unfreeze it uh, for a specified period of time, as long as you have that code. So just like a very important password, you should have that code when you get it. If you place the security freeze, keep that code in a safe place where you can get to it. I actually keep mine on my uh, in, a, in a note. A note on my iPhone. Now you know my little secret. My code is in a note on the iPhone, but uh, uh, it's very important for you to be able to access that code when you need it. I bought a car a couple of years ago and I bought it on credit. While I was sitting in the dealership, they were trying to bring up my credit report. I said, oh, I see you have a security freeze on your credit. Uh, so I logged in to, I said, which bureau are you using? Okay, log into that website, go to the place where you lift the security freeze, put in the code, along with some other personal information, and then tell them how long I want that freeze to be lifted. Uh, it turns out in my experience, you should lift it for several days because typically a lender will um, initially pull your credit and then come back later and double check it again before they give you the loan. Uh, so security freeze, much like a password manager, is not as bad as it may seem. It's not as hard to deal with. All of the people that give credit know about them uh, they know how to support them. It's not a problem. It's not going to prevent you from getting that refinance you're trying to get. And remember, there are actually four credit bureaus. Most people have heard of the big three. Equifax, Experian, TransUnion. There's a fourth one called Innovis. 
And if you're going to be doing the security freeze, you want to make sure you do it at Innovus 2. Otherwise, that's a channel that fraudsters can use. Um, now, I've done this for my son as well. Children that have no credit history at all uh, can still benefit from a security freeze because then somebody can't impersonate them and ruin their credit report. Okay, so final, uh, final takeaway here. Remember what social engineers are trying to do. They're trying to get you to move with haste and without thinking. So if you can slow down and think, you can save yourself potentially from being scammed. Um, be suspicious, don't trust emails, don't trust the internet. Make sure that uh, you double check with somebody if they claim to be, we see it all the time. We see uh, people coming saying, yeah, my CEO said I need to wire this money to Hong Kong right now. Uh, we say, you better call them on the phone and just confirm that instruction. Um, if we, if Fremont Bank questions a transaction, calls you and says, hey, you know, we're not sure about this transaction, um, we recommend that you take that seriously. We do have customers that get scammed. Uh, we have, as I mentioned in the beginning, we have very sophisticated fraud detection technology based on artificial intelligence. It will tell us uh, this is a suspicious transaction. If we call you and say, hey, um, we see that you're trying to send you know, a large amount of money to this lottery company, uh, we think that's a scam. Um, I would say about 25% of the time our customers push back. They don't believe it. They want to believe the lottery is real. But if your bank is calling you, you probably should uh, take that seriously. And finally, I, I, I would be gratified if any of the information I gave you today is helpful to you in any way. Uh, I hope that you found something um, that uh, you could find useful, but I, I hope even more that you can share this with your family because the more people that know all these tricks, these social engineering tricks and the countermeasures they can use, the safer we all are. The only way to get rid of scammers is to stop giving them money. And the more people that become aware and immune to scams, uh, the less money they're gonna be making and less profit they're gonna be making and eventually there'll be fewer of them. So uh, we're here today to provide this information to you as a community service. We hope that it will help you um, and help all of us in reducing the spread of scams. With that, I'm going to thank you and um, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Chris. Chris, we can't, can't hear you. Chris, you're on mute. Chris, you're on mute. Thanks, Mark. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. <laughs> All right. A um, couple of things came up on chat, which are really good. So California State Automobile Association, better known as AAA, um, they uh, have a free um, credit um, watch program that you can sign up for if you're a AAA member and, and sign up for the roadside assistance on an annual basis. And so that's that's a pretty um, nice option um, that's not expensive. Uh, there's no ad for that. Another question came up and that is um, on freezing your credit. <clears throat> you do need to freeze all four independently and you do need to you know, take it off um, at the big three if you're gonna apply for a mortgage loan because um, mortgage companies, banks like Fremont Bank that do residential mortgages, do we look at all three credit reports we merge those together to get an average so in those cases you'd have to release your um uh, take the suspect take your freeze off for a period of time a week a few days um so hopefully that answers um those couple questions i was seeing there was a couple more yeah, there. there's a couple there chris can can i can i answer one other yep. question go ahead i didn't see but i i just i think that's probably worth pointing out if you do if you do freeze your credit it's uh, let me be really clear about this. If you freeze your credit, you can still use your existing credit. You can use your credit cards, you can use your home loan, all these things that you already have. It only prevents people from opening up new credit. Good point, Mark. Thanks. And that, that's one to mention. Uh, freezing 
does not mean you can't use your Visa cards, your MasterCards. You continue to use everything that you've got. It just, um, someone can't pull a new credit report in order to apply for credit for you. So um, the other thing is there are a lot of, of the big credit card companies, whether it be Capital One or Citi or JP Morgan, <laughs> um, Visa, MasterCard, where um, you, if you sign up for their online service, they give you your credit scores and you can watch those on a monthly basis. It even goes as far as to tell you um, where your credit may have declined and why it declined. Um, and that would give you a red flag if someone was trying to play with your credit. So um, very good um, you know, services and we are all responsible for keeping an eye on our credit at the end of the day. Um, so Mark, as, as always, great presentation. Um, I can tell the group here that uh, you know, Mark and I um, attend the hacker conferences, um, the security conferences. We are always looking for how can a hacker or a fraudster get to um, our customer base um, or to um, Fremont Bank. We're very proud that we've never had a breach. Um, we're very, very proud that you can trust us. We're a secure bank. Um, we do a great job and we want your trust and we want you to continue banking with us. And we appreciate your relationship with the bank. Without you, we wouldn't be a bank. So um, thank you so much for attending today. Thanks for your um, continued relationship with the bank. Um, we have three prizes that I get to announce. So you're gonna have to bear with me a hair because our, our compliance officer says I have to repeat each of the winner's names three times. So um, our first prize, which is a wine tour basket. And this includes four wines from uh, Fremont Bank um, winery customers that uh, bank with Fremont Bank. And so this basket includes uh, one from each, four wines. And that winner is Allison Lightbody. Allison Lightbody, you're gonna be having wine and cheese Wow, that's soon. wonderful. <laughs> and I just wanna note, do I have to send a credit card first to get it? No, um, but if you give me your account, if you give me your, if you give me your account number, I'll be happy to process that for you. <laughs> hey, thanks a lot. So, Allison Lightbody, congratulations! Um, and you. our um, our client services will be getting in touch with you via email um, to tell you about your prize. So, don't throw that email away, please. Don't throw that. <laughs> Wonderful. Away. Thank you very much. Um, second prize, which is a whiskey basket. Uh, we're moving up from wine to whiskey now. So this includes a bartender kit, um, single barrel select bourbon, um, an ice set, two glasses, and a whiskey baron cocktail recipe. Uh, whiskey baron is uh, one of our clients. And so, uh, and it comes from beer baron actually is the client. And they'll give you a recipe for mixing a whiskey cocktail. So there are two glasses. And Mark tells me if you give him your address, he'll join you for that second uh, cocktail. Absolutely. So, uh, and that's Ashley Weirpass. Ashley Weirpass, you are our second prize winner. Ashley, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Hey, Thank you very you much. Are. You're you're very welcome. Congratulations. Uh, and by Ashley the way, Weirpass. I do like whiskey. So, <laughs> well, wow, that's 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 good luck. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> And then our grand prize, prize number three, um, this is a two night romantic getaway. And that does not include Mark or I. So it's a two night romantic <laughs> getaway to um, our uh, the Fremont Bank's uh, Los Altos house, which is in Pebble Beach, um, up on the wow. hill, beautiful home. Um, you'll have a great time there. And that prize goes to Robin Sui, if I got that last name right. Robin Sui? Robin Choi, T-S-O-I. Choi, I'm sorry, okay. <laughs> Robin Choi, you have won the grand prize for tonight, today. That's so, crazy, um, thank you so much. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> you're very welcome. And you get to invite somebody with you. You don't have to take any of us, so you're in good shape. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. So thanks all for attending. I think we had well over 100 on the call um, and uh, we, we appreciate you attending today. And hopefully we can do more of these in the future. So um, I'm signing off. Uh, Mark, do you want to say anything last uh, for everyone? No, oh, just thank you to everyone. Uh, I, I hope that you found some usefulness out of this. Got a lot of uh, great feedback in the comments. We're, I'm glad we could be of, of service to you. Take care of yourself. Take care of your family. Um, and uh, 
and, and take care.